Serving God I have brought you thus far through the two preceding chapters with a view to finally settling the question of duty. This is one that puzzles and perplexes very many people who are earnest and sincere and gives them a great deal of difficulty in its solution. When they start out to make something of themselves and to practice the science of being great, they find themselves necessarily compelled to rearrange many of their relationships. There are friends who perhaps must be alienated. There are relatives who misunderstand and who feel that they are in some way being slighted. The really great man is often considered selfish by a large circle of people who are connected with him and who feel that he might bestow upon them more benefits than he does. The question at the outset is, is it my duty to make the most of myself regardless of everything else? Or shall I wait until I can do so without any friction or without causing loss to anyone? This is the question of duty to self versus duty to others. One's duty to the world has been thoroughly discussed in the preceding pages, and I give some consideration now to the idea of duty to God. An immense number of people have a great deal of uncertainty, not to say anxiety, as to what they ought to do for God. The amount of work and service that is done for Him in these United States in the way of church work and so on is enormous. An immense amount of human energy is expended in what is called serving God. I propose to consider briefly what serving God is and how a man may serve God best. And I think I shall be able to make plain that the conventional idea as to what constitutes service to God is all wrong. When Moses went down into Egypt to bring out the Hebrews from bondage, his demand upon Pharaoh in the name of the deity was, Let the people go that they may serve me. He led them out into the wilderness and there instituted a new form of worship, which has led many people to suppose that worship constitutes the service of God, although later God himself distinctly declared that he cared nothing for ceremonies, burned offerings, or oblation, and the teaching of Jesus, if rightly understood, would do away with organized temple worship altogether. God does not lack anything that men may do for him with their hands or bodies, or voices. St. Paul points out that man can do nothing for God, for God does not need anything. The view of evolution which we have taken shows God seeking expression through man. Through all the successive ages in which His Spirit has urged man up the height, God has gone on seeking expression. Every generation of men is more godlike than the preceding generation. Every generation of men demands more in the way of fine homes, pleasant surroundings, congenial work, rest, travel, and opportunity for study than the preceding generation. I have heard some short-sighted economists argue that the working people of today ought surely to be fully contented because their condition is so much better than that of the working man 200 years ago who slept in a windowless hut on a floor covered with rushes in company with his pigs. If that man had all that he was able to use for the living of all the life he knew how to live, he was perfectly content, and if he had lack, he was not contented. The man of today has a comfortable home, and very many things indeed that were unknown a short period back in the past, and if he has all that he can use for the living of all the life he can imagine, he will be content. But he is not content. God has lifted the race so far that any common man can picture a better and more desirable life than he is able to live under existing conditions. And so long as this is true, so long as a man can think and clearly picture to himself a more desirable life, he will be discontented with the life he has to live, and rightly so. That discontent is the Spirit of God, urging men on to more desirable conditions. It is God who seeks expression in the race. He worketh in us to will and to do. The only service you can render God is to give expression to what He is trying to give the world through you. The only service you can render God is to make the very most of yourself in order that God may live in you to the utmost of your possibilities. In a former work of this series, The Science of Getting Rich, 
I refer to the little boy at the piano, the music in whose soul could not find expression through his untrained hands. This is a good illustration of the way the Spirit of God is over, about, around, and in all of us, seeking to do great things with us, so soon as we will train our hands and feet, our minds, brains, and bodies to do His service. Your first duty to God, to yourself and to the world, is to make yourself as great a personality in every way as you possibly can. And that, it seems to me, disposes of the question of duty. There are one or two other things which might be disposed of in closing this chapter. I have written of opportunity in a preceding chapter. I have said, in a general way, that it is within the power of every man to become great, just as in The Science of Getting Rich, I declared that it is within the power of every man to become rich. But these sweeping generalizations need qualifying. There are men who have such materialistic minds that they are absolutely incapable of comprehending the philosophy set forth in these books. There is a great mass of men and women who have lived and worked until they are practically incapable of thought along these lines, and they cannot receive the message. Something may be done for them by demonstration, that is, by living the life before them, but that is the only way they can be aroused. The world needs demonstration more than it needs teaching. For this mass of people, our duty is to become as great in personality as possible in order that they may see and desire to do likewise. It is our duty to make ourselves great for their sakes, so that we may help prepare the world that the next generation shall have better conditions for thought. One other point. I am frequently written to by people who wish to make something of themselves and to move out into the world, but who are hampered by home ties having others more or less dependent upon them, whom they fear would suffer if left alone. In general, I advise such people to move out fearlessly and to make the most of themselves. If there is a loss at home, it will be only temporary and apparent. For in a little while, if you follow the leading of spirit, you will be able to take better care of your dependents than you have ever done before. End of chapter 20